All right, welcome everybody. Uh, delighted to have uh, four distinguished panelists with us today to talk about uh, a very rich and complicated subject, the implications of the war in Ukraine, the one that was intensified uh, in February of 2022 uh, and its implications for NATO, for the European Union, uh, maybe for European politics writ large. Uh, and uh, I will give only the briefest of introductions to our four distinguished speakers. Uh, and then we can jump into their opening statements. We'll have you know, sort of discussion among uh, the five of us after that, and we will very much welcome your questions uh, along the way uh, so that this can become a broader discussion uh, down the road. So uh, I'll introduce our speakers in the order that they'll be speaking uh, at this event. First, we have uh, Rachel Rizzo uh, of the Europe program at the Atlantic Council. Uh, after Rachel, we'll have Max Bergman, Director of the Europe Program at CSIS. After Max, we'll have uh, Hans Kunani, Director of the Europe Program uh, at Chatham House. Uh, and then after Hans, we'll have Jade McGlynn uh, of the Monterey Initiative uh, in Russian Studies. Uh, so that by way of introduction, uh, of course, could speak at great length about everybody's publications and, uh, and public appearances. But uh, suffice it to say for all four panelists that they're very uh, they're very extensive. So with that uh, having been said, let me pass the baton to, uh, to Rachel for the first statement and we'll go uh, after Rachel to, to Max. Rachel, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation and for hosting this event. I think it's gonna be a really interesting discussion. So I think I wanna start by talking a little bit about how this war in Ukraine has affected both NATO and the EU but in different ways. Um, and I think the broad overarching point I'd like to make is that the war has focused NATO in a way that it hasn't been focused for a long time. Um, but it, on the other hand, and on the flip side, it has created, I think, a bit of chaos in, in the European Union. Um, I think looking at NATO specifically and looking at NATO first, you have to go back in history a few decades, you know, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, I think NATO has at times really struggled to find a North Star. When there's no common enemy or no common strategic challenge, I think it can be difficult for an alliance, a multinational alliance like NATO, to rally around a common cause. Of course, there was solidarity after September 11th, and there have been a few successful out of area operations, but there were also, you could argue, some relatively important failures as well. So I think more broadly over the last decade or so, you really do see the alliance and you have seen the alliance do a lot of things sort of well, rather than a few things very well um, that are in service of one common goal or, or one common strategy. So that's, I think, where we are today or where we were before February. So. I think what this war has done is sort of coalesced NATO around this common vision, or at least I hope that it's coalesced NATO around this common vision of NATO, uh, of Russia being the main challenge that NATO should be focusing on. Looking ahead at the NATO summit at the end of June, we'll likely begin the process of welcoming two new members in Sweden and Finland which I wouldn't have predicted at the beginning of this conflict. I was asked and many other people were asked if we thought that NATO and our Finland and Sweden would change their stance on NATO membership. And I thought the answer was gonna be no. Um, the Alliance is also going to unveil a new strategic concept, which is basically this document that guides the Alliance over the next 10 years. Um, over the last six months or so, there have been a lot of conversations about how this strategic concept will differ from the concept of 2010, which didn't mention the word China even once. And so there's been a lot of talk about how China will be factored into this strategic concept. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of June, um, I think NATO realizes that its main focus does need to be on Russia but that the strategic concept isn't meant to last weeks or months or a year, it's meant to last a, a decade. So it's gonna be interesting to see how this has played into um, focusing NATO a little bit. Looking at the flip side, um, going away from NATO and looking at the European Union, I think this uh, the invasion of Ukraine has caused a bit of chaos in the EU surrounding questions of EU enlargement and granting EU candidate status to Ukraine. 
On February 28th, right after Ukraine was invaded, Ukraine applied for membership of the European Union. You've seen high-level statements from Ursula von der Leyen talking about how Ukraine's future is in, in Europe or the European Union. You've seen Emmanuel Macron come out pretty strong over the last few weeks about the fact that NATO joining the EU isn't going to happen overnight. It will take decades. There is no fast track here, nor should there be. The Germans use this talking point as well. And I think this is at the same time as other European countries are calling for a quick accession of Ukraine into the EU. So you already see the divides as to what this future might look like. Um, and it does look likely that the EU at their summit will likely grant candidate status to Ukraine at its summit. Um, this is only the beginning of a very, very long and arduous process. Um, it's bureaucratic. It's so detailed that it's easy to lose steam because the criteria is so difficult to meet. We just need to look at the Western Balkans for a good example of what that looks like in practice. Um, there's also worries about letting in a country into the block before it's actually ready, before it's completed all the necessary reforms, stamping out cor corruption and kleptocracy, rule of law. Um, you, you just look at Hungary for, for an example of that. Um, I think last month, Macron floated the idea of this European political community as a way for aspirant countries or non-EU countries entirely to be closer to the EU without actually being members. But if you're Ukraine, this is the last thing that you want. You want guarantees, you want things signed on a dotted line, and I just don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, I think the worry for a lot of people is that we're going to do to Ukraine when it comes to the EU, what we've done to them uh, in, in terms of NATO, which is make these sort of tacit promises about their eventual inclusion into the community without actually ever having a plan as to how it's getting done or being able to coalesce um, a coalition around, um, you know, getting them in. So that's just a couple of things I'll start with and then I'll, I'll pass it over to Max with that, I think. Uh, well, well, thanks, Rachel, and, and thanks, Michael, for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. Um, I, I, I very much agree, I think, with everything that Rachel said. I think I would just uh, maybe start by uh, noting that I actually think that the chaos that we're, that as she described it, um, that we're seeing in the EU uh, could actually be, be productive and actually lead to uh, a lot of further advancements. Um, but you know, maybe I'll, I'll start by talking about the EU and then, then maybe talking about NATO for a, a second. But I think right now, if you sort of go on Twitter and are following kind of the debate and discussion, uh, the ire being thrown at Germany is, is uh, you know, is ever present. I think you would have a sense that the Europeans haven't done very much and that the EU's response has been uh, quite weak. And some of this is quite natural because every time a, a, the EU or an a EU country does something, there's always a demand for it to do more. But I think if we take a step back, and I think this is frankly the perspective from Washington, uh, is really quite shocked at how strong the, the EU's response has been. And I actually think that this crisis, the EU has emerged globally, uh, as, has demonstrated its potential strength as a global actor. And it needs to be taken very seriously. Because what the EU has done is effectively leverage its market size, an economy the same size as the US, same size as China, uh, and has was uh, out in front on a number of sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Russia, much stronger, in fact, than I think the United States expected. And then at times, especially in the early part of the crisis, uh, went further than the US was even prepared to go, and the US had to catch up. Uh, and now we've the EU has successfully embargoed uh, Russian oil. Uh, yes, there's some caveats, but that was like not even on the table 100 days ago. Uh, prior to the war, no, there was no conception that that was even possible. I think I, I wrote a report back in January about what, what should be done if Russia invades Ukraine. And it was, well, a notional transition off of Russian energy that would take a number of years. And what we're seeing is this happening, I think, at, at, at warp speed. And I think what the important element here is the Europeans have demonstrated that they're willing to absorb economic harm for geopolitical interests and for their values. Uh, so when you're, you know, essentially uh, uh, having massive energy increase in energy crisis and energy prices uh, and taking a real economic hit for these sanctions, I think it demonstrates, in fact, the broader strength of, of the European Union. And I think the economic impacts uh, on Europe from 
Russia sanctions are in fact much stronger than they are in the United States. And I think that's important for us to understand here in the US. Uh, so I think that has demonstrated to the world the EU is willing to leverage its market power to advance its interests uh, and for geopolitical ends. The second thing I would say is that the EU has mobilized 1.5 billion, the EU itself, uh, euros for uh, security assistance to Ukraine. That's sort of crossing a Rubicon. Now the EU set up this program called the, in typical Brussels speak, the European Peace Facility, which was essentially lethal assistance. No one quite knew what security assistance, what EU security assistance would do. Well, now we know it is to provide massive amounts of uh, uh, money so that uh, uh, to Ukraine to uh, acquire European arms. Um, and I think that is important. I think what we're seeing also the EU putting out a number of proposals on how to coordinate the defense spending that is uh, the increase in defense spending that we're seeing. So I think there's, I think this crisis will lead to math, massive and uh, 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 it will be pathbreaking in terms of the EU's role in defense, and I think in, in the broader global perceptions. Just on enlargement and treaty reform, and I think this is the other important area, is that now it's opened up something that had been totally stagnant, and that is enlargement. Enlargement to the ba Balkans, I think, is in incredibly important, as is potential enlargement to Ukraine. I think the U.S. has a real interest in this happening, but it's only going to happen is if there's treaty reform. The French and other Western Europeans, it's not just the French, aren't going to move forward in expanding the EU past 30 members, potentially, unless there's movement away from qualitative majority voting, unless there's real action on rule of law. Now, all of this is going to be really difficult, but it strikes me now that suddenly there is a real political path to uh, having a, a discussion where the East Europeans you know, can, are speaking out of both sides of their mouth when they say that they want Ukraine to be an EU member, but then they write a letter saying that they are against any treaty reform. You can't be for Ukraine joining and against potential reforming the EU. Every previous enlargement had seen changes to how the EU uh, organized itself. And I think that's particularly essential. And I think one of the things we see in this crisis, and maybe I'll, I'll close here before, well, I'll say one thing on NATO, but one of the things we see in this crisis is that there's always a demand that why isn't the EU doing more? Well. <laughs> What happens is the EU is not empowered to do more. We saw this during COVID, where it was the EU was not supposed to be involved in health policy, but then suddenly the EU takes a role. And so I think what we see is that the EU is forged in crisis, and that there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of reforms, a lot of action taken. That I think we're going to look back at 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 this crisis, uh, at this war, as as succeeding to further transforming Europe and bring uh, and strengthening the European Union overall. Just quickly on NATO and, uh, and the increase in defense spending that we're seeing, I think this is really significant for Europe as well, that countries across the board are now spend, gonna, are committed to spending a lot more. And when you see a country like Germany committing to spending 2% on defense and spending 100 billion, uh, that's gonna have a massive impact on how Europe is viewed globally and Europe's military strength. Now, whether Germany will spend that money exactly you know, correctly, there's a lot of complaints about German military bureaucracy, but the basic fact is that German tanks aren't ready to roll, its ships aren't ready to sail, and its planes aren't ready to fly. So if you just fix that and basically repair all you know, what's broken and begin to improve German readiness, you then have an incredibly strong military. And I think that will uh, add to Europe's value, not just in, in the European theater vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but potentially... Uh, also uh, in the Indo-Pacific, if, if Europe is spending more on defense, it's also spending more on its Navy and air assets that can be deployed there. So I think this has broader global implications uh, for NATO, for the Transatlantic Alliance uh, going forward. Terrific, thank you so much, uh, both Rachel and Max. Uh, we turn now to our third speaker, to, to Hans Kunani. Hans, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Michael, thanks for having me. Um, so I'll sort of respond to a little of what Max and, and Rachel said on, on the EU and NATO. Um, I guess I should probably preface this by saying, I think um, I may be, um, I, I'm relatively kind of ambivalent and conflicted about this um, war in Ukraine. I'm less sort of wholeheartedly behind it than I think a lot of uh, people um, in um, you know, the foreign policy uh, sort of establishment in, in Europe and the United States. Um, and and so, you know, I don't think of this in terms of, you know, the, the metric for this shouldn't be, you know, how willing are the EU and NATO to be tough 
um, to me, that's a that's a problematic metric in, in itself. You know, so part of what I'll say about the EU and NATO is sort of slightly questioning that 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 assumption. Um, on NATO, I mean, I broadly agree with with what Rachel said about the way that this war has been. I think the way I would put it, it's been a kind of a lifeline for NATO. Actually, that NATO was in a real crisis before um, this war started. You know, embodied by you know comments by Trump and Macron about NATO. Um, and the way I think of the sort of history of NATO is that during the Cold War, um, the glue that held NATO together was a, a, a you know common perception of a threat from the Soviet Union. Right, it wasn't values. Um, there were authoritarian states within NATO during the Cold War. Um, then what happened after the end of the Cold War was that um, common perception of a threat from the Soviet Union disappeared and NATO tried to reinvent itself in various different ways, one of which was as a as a, a you know an alliance of democracies, an alliance based on, on values. Um, and you know, and so I think for that period, as it looked for a kind of a new mission, you know, the, the glue became increasingly a sort of an ideological kind of glue rather than a strategic glue. Um, until the war in Ukraine started, we were once again in a position where we had authoritarian states in NATO again, and we didn't have a common threat perception, right? So I was was, was you know saying quite a lot. I don't understand anymore what the glue is that's going to hold NATO together. Um, in that sense, I think, um, you know, the, the war in Ukraine has been a, a lifeline. It has refocused NATO on its um, on its original historic kind of core mission. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I think it's worth underlining that we still have this problem uh, of, of, you know, creeping authoritarianism within NATO. I think that problem hasn't gone away. And I think we have to, I think in the medium term, that's going to be a real problem for NATO um, unless that can be fixed. And I suppose I'm perhaps slightly less... Um, sort of enthusiastic about this refocusing of NATO on that common goal than, than maybe Rachel is. What I what I hear a lot of from Atlanticists in the last you know three months is excitement, and that slightly worries me. That kind of mood of we're back that slightly worries me. I'd love to come back to that in the discussion. And then on um, on the EU, um, so. Um, yes, I mean again, I sort of broadly agree with with what Max um, said. Um, you know, there have been some breakthroughs in terms of the way the way that the EU has responded. As I say, I'm a little bit kind of ambivalent about things like the sanctions, though, um, partly because of their impact on the rest of the world, um, but partly also because I don't think we actually have um, uh, a shared set of, of objectives that we're trying to achieve with these sanctions. I think what happened was we had a, a, a you know, we had a deterrent strategy in the run up to the war. Which essentially failed in terms of deterring Russia from um, from invading Ukraine, and then we ramped up the sanctions. But I think without a clear idea of what we're trying to achieve, and when you talk to officials in European countries and the United States, they all give you very very different answers of what this um, strategy of, of of massive sanctions is is meant to uh, is meant to achieve. So I'm a little bit worried um, about that too. Um, on enlargement, um, I think there are very good reasons for being very hesitant uh, about um, uh, about further enlargement, not just for the reasons that Max said in terms of the internal functionality uh, of, of, of the EU. Um, I think enlargement has made the EU largely dysfunctional, um, but also because I worry about the idea of um, any further steps towards um, accession for Ukraine without having NATO membership first. All of the um, Central and Eastern European countries that after the end of the Cold War, joined the EU and NATO, joined the Na joined NATO first. And that was really important because it meant they had a security guarantee. And it seems to me that part of actually how we got into this mess in the first place was by taking steps um, in relation to the EU. I'm thinking obviously particularly of the EU accession agreement um, in, um, in, in 2014 um, without a NATO security guarantee, which I think was, was kind of uh, what... Um, part of what led to um, the, the Russian um, uh, annexation of Crimea and the invasion of Eastern Ukraine. Um, I think that the EU's response, you know, although it has done some of the things that Max said, I think it actually it's illustrated that the EU, the, the difficulty of the EU being a geopolitical actor. And I think the accession debate shows that because what happens is the debate goes round and round in circles where some people say we need to act geopolitically, therefore we need to have Ukraine in the EU. But then the rules kick in, you start to have this debate about the rules, um, and that then I think illustrates um, how actually the EU, I think has a structural, there's a structural reason why the EU can't be 
geopolitical. I think we also saw that this in the way that it handled Brexit. Um, and maybe just one final thing um, uh, is that I think there are some interesting shifts, which again, we might want to come back to in the discussion around the sort of internal, I mean, we're talking a lot about the EU and NATO, but, but, but the, the dynamics between individual countries in both of those organizations and outside of those organizations. And here, since I've mentioned Brexit, I think I have to do, I have to mention the UK because I think the UK um, has, you know, demonstrated um, its role as a security provider for Europe in the war in Ukraine. And, um, you know, that I think does um, kind of, it does mean that it's quite difficult for actually the EU to play a very ambitious role in, in, in European security. Um, because it immediately raises the question of where does the, the UK fit into that. So I think there is a kind of a division of labour that you could have between NATO and the EU and also ad hoc formats like, for example, the British-led Joint Expeditionary Force. But I think it involves having a, con a conversation about strategic autonomy, European strategic autonomy, but outside of the EU rather than seeing as the, e the EU is a vehicle to deliver that. Wonderful. Thank you, Hans. Having mentioned the UK, let's turn now to, to, to London uh, and, to, and to Jane. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And thank you um, for inviting me to be on the panel. Actually, quite a lot of my thoughts, I think, um, take off from, from where some of Hans's points um, left off. And in general, I, I actually agree with, certainly with um, with his scepticism, <laughs> maybe with his pessimism. Um, maybe it's, it's a London thing. Um, but I think you asked us, Michael, um, for this panel to think about sort of a challenge and an opportunity. And I think that in some ways, um, and again, this links into something that, that Hans has said, that it's it's this revitalization that you can sort of feel in the air, even if it's only sort of rhetorical um, of, of, of presumably of, of liberal democratic values, of, of sort of human freedoms that, that many um, feel, um, and in, including myself actually, um, is, is sort of represented by Ukrainian resistance to, to Russia's war, but also that supposedly underpin both institutions. Um, and I think that it's this revitalization or potential revitalization that presents both the challenge, but, and also of course, potentially the opportunity. Um, if we, if I sort of start with the EU, and I and I should say, obviously, I'm not a specialist um, in the EU or on NATO. Um, I specialize um, in 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 Russia and Russian foreign policy, Russian politics. So um, that's very much what I'm about to say is going to come very much from that perspective. Um, but with all that said, if we start with the EU, of course, it's a little bit. I feel sometimes it's a bit awkward for me um, as as a Brit to pontificate about who the EU should let in, who they shouldn't let in, who they should grant candidate status to. But I I won't let that stop me um, because I I do think that the EU should grant Ukraine candidate status um, at, at the upcoming conference, and I think. It should do so, of course, as a political signal that Ukraine sort of belongs um, in at least on a pathway <laughs> towards um, sort of the, the European family. But um, also, I think it affirms Ukraine's own kind of self narration of, of its story about identity and it negates Russia's um, narration of Ukraine's identity by showing Ukraine, you know, if it wants to be has, has can be this member of the European order and not it isn't um, just some some province that should be left left to Russia. Of course, candidate status isn't only a political signal as as, as all of the speakers so far have, have referenced. If we're going to say, okay, saying candidate status today means potential membership tomorrow. And there are some very involved, highly bureaucratic processes and hoops um, that will need to be jumped through. I actually think that in itself, this process would be good for Ukraine. Um, of course, somebody's, um, I think, Rachel, you mentioned um, about sort of corruption and kleptocracy. Clearly, these are issues, though, I suppose, um, you uh, you know, say around judges in particular, though, I suppose, um, of course, it's not just Ukraine that, that faces issues of, of corruption. There are many EU countries, and indeed, many non-EU countries, um, including UK, that, that have some of these issues as well. And it's always worth thinking, where is that money that's been stolen? Where is it squirreled away? A lot of it's in, um, in the UK. But also, Ukraine has also clearly developed an admirably vibrant civil society um, and many other important kind of democratic or liberal democratic facets that... Um, 
that have been shown during the war. And I think that's a third reason why Ukraine should be granted candidate status and, and um, should be put onto the accession process, because I think it could revivify um, the, the EU. I think as well, there's a lot of lessons it could teach it about resilience, um, some of the areas um, perhaps it's been struggling with, and of course, reconnecting with the values that it, it does like to espouse. Um, I think otherwise it risks looking like the EU is just a sort of protectionist trading block with people or nations who were lucky enough to get on the boat in time, um, Hungary, regardless of whether they deserve to be there or not. Um, and, and if that is the case, fine, but it, I don't really see a very promising future. Um, I think that for NATO, again, it's been discussed, we're clearly talking about an existing revitalization, at least on a superficial level rather than a, a future potential one, um, the application of Sweden and, and Finland for membership, which Putin uh, and Russia and the Kremlin have accepted bluntly quite meekly, um, a point that I think has to sort of be answered by anybody who thinks that sort of Russia's bombing Ukrainian hospitals and, and children because of NATO expansion alone, um, and a point that I want to return to just at the, the, at the end, and hopefully we'll get into during the discussion. Um, but I don't think it's yet clear to what extent the revitalization of NATO is more than superficial or more than the level of sort of rhetoric and reaction. NATO, of course, doesn't even really need to respond that much because it's the individual member states doing their bit or not doing their bit, as the discussion has, has, has already covered. But I suppose what I worry about is that this kind of exuberance, this energy that's come from the Ukrainian resistance and sort of in, inspired NATO or given it energy, I think, is it actually including the need to think about a longer term strategy? So what does a sustainable security architecture for Europe look like? Where does Ukraine fit um, You know, in the long run? Of course, it's very difficult to predict how the war might end, but let's, in, in, in different scenarios, where does Ukraine fit within that architecture? How does, how does this architecture withstand a re-election of Trump or, or of a Trump esque person and and how can it overcome divisions um you know of, say turkey's position on on particularly the accession of sweden and, and also finland since they're linked but um especially on sweden um and we see these divisions of course as well with aiding ukraine and max has already spoken about them the difference in responses has led to clear division between what the russians call sort of anglo saxy the anglo-saxons um and essentially the us and uk eastern europe on one side and then france and germany arguably italy and some others on 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 slightly other side and i have to say perhaps hans you disagree but i feel like in the uk that this division is quite widely is, is is quite strongly felt um i know that writing i was reading the other day sort of adam two's writing in the new statesman about how sort of this franco-german approach is almost like a post-heroic european identity that that should be embraced um, and that europe should recognize um its historical and its sort of political and cultural distance from the patriotic enthusiasm that that's been so um vividly and spectacularly on display in ukraine but from the flip side, I wonder also whether or not this distance isn't isn't a problem. Perhaps this distance is part of what's leading to, to disenchantment with the EU. And I hope this isn't becoming too abstract, but, you know, of what's inflaming sort of cynicism and, and populism and, and populist leaders that, that so undermine these same projects. Um, and I think this is an important point, even if I, it is a bit abstract, because, of course, the Kremlin is, is very aware of this. And that's why ultimately they think that Russia will win any war of attrition, which it looks like. Russia's three day special operation has turned into because they think that the West will lose interest, that they'll sell the Ukrainians out, that they'll sort of sue for peace. Essentially, they think that that Russia um, and, and they have what it takes and that the West, however you describe it, doesn't, you know, that the EU and um, well, particularly the EU in the long term won't stand up for its values, that it will place greed and comfort, perhaps warmth above humanity, you know, above its above its support for Ukraine. And I think that's what Russia's counting on. And I also think that they're quite right to count on it in some ways, because it is clearly an important variable. And I'm not sure which way it will go um, in terms of the development of the war. And I know, again, I apologize for it sort of being abstract, but I think from my conversations with people, this war from the Russian side is based on quite abstract notions. And, and perhaps even if we're blunt, some imagined um, notions, Russia's war aims and the invasion itself, they're based more on sort of internal um, reality or perception, which, which doesn't necessarily correlate to, 
to what's actually happened, but is, is, I mean, I suppose everybody's understanding of reality is shaped by their interpretation of it, but this can sometimes be quite a warped interpretation. So whilst the war is about Ukraine, um, and on one level, I think it's also about Russian identity um, in, in Putin's mind, but also in Russians' minds, um, and it, particularly in those Russians who support the war. Um, and it's about Russia's right to spheres of interest, to be a great power, to avenge the 1990s, to be a separate civilization, to call out Western hypocrisy, it is about security concerns that were legitimate, but that have given rise to such paranoid thinking and sort of fetid obsessions that they're now clearly doing more to undermine Russian security and great power status than the NATO could ever dream of. So I think to be more specific, I would say that NATO, the EU, Collective West, whatever, if we sort of broaden it out, needs to understand that in, in Russia's mind, this very in well, not in Russia's mind, but in, in the mind of many Russians, this is a war with the West. And if we think that it can just be fixed by feeding um, Russia bits of Ukraine or, or keeping Ukraine out of the out of the club, then I think that's silly. I think that ultimately this, this is an opportunity to maybe revitalize like the whole idea of the West. But I mean, that's a much broader conversation of, of what needs to be revisited. Clearly a lot of mistakes have been made since the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, but I think this this could be a chance for that, but I'm very skeptical to think that anyone will take it. Sorry. Wonderful, thank you, Tatum. I'm glad that you were pessimistic in a way on all accounts, um, you know, sort of pessimistic also about Russia undermining its own, uh, its own security. I think it makes for a very, uh, in a way, a very sort of uh, comprehensive uh, argument. Well, thanks so much to the to the four of you. I really have three core questions that I want to run through with you before we turn this over to our uh, to our audience. So let me just list them in advance. Um, of course, they're all interrelated, and, and I hope they follow directly from uh, you know the wonderful opening impulses the four of you have just given. I wanted to hone in first on the question of Ukraine. We'll offer a certain idea about Ukrainian security, and then. From that ask about um, questions of political integration, I know you've addressed them already, but just you know, sort of pushing you for a little bit more detail. Secondly, one question we haven't you know sort of addressed uh, yet uh, is in these new notions of Europe, and I think all of you are perfectly convincing that there will be a new Europe in one form or fashion that emerges from this war. You know, sort of the the question of Russia vis-a-vis -vis this new Europe, I would like to ask about. Uh, about that, Jade, you touched about that. Touch on that point in your uh, in your comments that Russia can't be appeased by being given a bit of territory or sort of promised Ukrainian neutrality. That that wouldn't be the solution to the problem. So I want to think collectively with the the four of you about what might the solution to the problem look like, or might how how should one approach this larger question of where Russia fits and 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 to, to a greater extent where Russia does not fit uh, in in Europe at large. And then thirdly. Um, also picking on a, up on a point that you made a moment ago, Jade, uh, issues of sort of populism or domestic politics within the US, within uh, the countries of Europe and, and, and how this uh, accords with some of the larger foreign policy questions that, uh, that all of you have been uh, so creatively thinking through. So first to start with Ukraine, I wonder if one couldn't argue at the moment that in a way what Ukraine has is something better than NATO membership, uh, it has, you know, an almost no limits um, degree of military support, especially from the U.S., but, uh, you know, from across uh, Europe. I mean, in a way, a security guarantee on paper or the whole uh, complexity of joining NATO uh, might be less valuable than what Ukraine has. And perhaps one could extrapolate that from that, that security questions in Ukraine actually have a pretty bright future. Um, you know, that there is a way in which this country is going to survive this war and potentially emerge stronger. That's really not what most of us, I think, would have predicted on the eve of the, uh, of the invasion. That's not, not so much that that I wish you to comment on, although I wanted to make the point. What I wanted you to comment on is, to me, the very thorny question of Ukraine's institutional integration. So let's say even if the war ends relatively soon and relatively well on Ukraine's terms, does the integration of Ukraine into Europe include Crimea? Uh, you know, sort of what does Ukraine's political integration look like if the border issues are not entirely certain? Uh, sort of how is that to be, uh, how is that to be managed? Because I don't think most of us assume that Ukraine is going to regain all of its territory. Of course, if it did, then integration could occur uh, 
um, under those circumstances. But if let's say Ukraine, as Zelensky has said, gets back to the sort of pre-February 20, pre 24th borders uh, heroically, and then starts the process of accession to, uh, to the EU, how will the EU manage this sort of territorial issue that's been there since, uh, since 2014? Uh, and what might the political integration of Ukraine look like sort of one year, two, th two three, four years uh, from now as best as you can, uh, as best as you can say? So anybody want to jump in with that question of sort of um, on what terms should one expect Ukraine's political integration to occur? I guess very quickly, I would just say, I, I'm, I mean, the EU has dealt with um, other territorial disputes. Again, this isn't my specialist area, but perhaps some others can speak about it. But I mean, Gibraltar. Um, has, has obviously been um, a bit of an issue. So I, I, I don't think it, it, it would necessarily, if we're, if we're talking about the post, it was the sort of 23rd of February borders, I don't see personally why it would have to be such a, I don't see why it would have to be a complete no, obviously uh, difficulties would need to be worked out. But, um, and in terms of, I, I don't think that it's realistic to, and I don't think that many in Ukraine are really talking, um, certainly for now, about a, about anything more than a return um, to the 23rd of February borders. Um, not certainly in the immediate future or even the short or, or medium term. Clearly, in the long term, um, I think they raise sort of good points around, well, if you, I mean, you only have to look at a map of Russia to understand to understand that Russia is not lacking in territory. It's not just about something as simple as that. It's clearly again about this sort of identity and values and, and what who belongs where. Um, but I think um, I think there are important questions Ukrainians are raising about whether or not if if that's just allowed to happen. Um, you know that the, the Crimea just remain particularly Crimea just remains um, in Russia. Um, whether or not that won't just then fuel. Um, this continued kind of, you know, the more territory Putin's given, the more he'll be likely to return for more and more territory of, of Ukraine. But in any case, that's going to then take us into a, into a discussion of the war in Ukraine. So I'll leave it there. Any other thoughts about Ukraine? So Rachel, Max, and then Hans, if you want to jump in uh, as, as a kind of last word on this point. Well, one thing, <clears throat> Michael, that you mentioned, you said doesn't it doesn't have something better than NATO membership right now, which is seemingly unlimited military support. And I think what I would say to that is, I don't know that this support is unlimited because we are already seeing support for Ukraine being used as a political tool here in the United States ahead of the November midterms. There have been questions from sort of the more right wing, the right wing of the Republican party talking about why the EU is providing um, much less money in support for Ukraine vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, this $40 billion aid package that was voted on. Americans are seeing really high inflation rates. They're paying a lot of money at the gas pump. This doesn't seem like it's gonna go away any soon, anytime soon. And so I wonder if, in the lead up to the November midterms, this is really going to become a hot button issue. It already is actually. And Biden is going to be under increased pressure to sort of temper that support. Also, we don't have unlimited uh, military equipment. Whatever we give to Ukraine um, needs to either be re-procured or, or uh, same with countries who decide to give uh, military support to Ukraine and expect the United States to backfill with our uh, weapon systems. And so I, I think the idea that this support is, is unlimited um, maybe isn't, isn't the right one. And we've seen a lot of solidarity over the last few months. But my question is, the longer that this goes on, the, that solidarity, I think we can expect to fracture. OK, that intersects with some points that Jade was making earlier. And we can re return to those when we speak about domestic <coughs> politics across, across the transatlantic space. Max? Sure. Well, Michael, I think your question hits at the kind of it's the it's the key key problem. It's the key issue of what are Ukraine's borders, and I think this is part of the reason why uh, I don't think Russia's invasion of Ukraine was about NATO expansion because it, it Russia already had a de facto veto 
over Ukraine's membership of NATO because if Ukraine joined NATO post 2014, then NATO was at war with Russia. So I think one of the, the major issues is just what are Ukraine's borders and does it have clearly set defined borders? Uh, I think when it comes to the EU, um, I think it should be granted candidate status. Not all problems have to be figured out uh, right away. But I think when you look back at past EU enlargements, uh, I think most folks in the EU would say letting Cyprus in without sort of resolving its territorial uh, uh, dispute with Turkey um, and uh, without that peace process having been successful was a real mistake because then uh, Cyprus was let in uh, and there's been no progress uh, since. And so I think um, there's going to have to be uh, some clarity, I think, on what Ukraine's borders are. What I'd also say is I think this is, frankly, uh, Zelensky's main goal, I think, after this crisis is EU membership. I think that is his clear objective. Uh, and I think the only way I could see potential territorial concessions being made, and I think we're too early in the war to actually r really think about whether territorial concessions would be made. But hypothetically, if um, you know Ukraine's unable to take back Crimea, which I don't think they will be able to, uh, the concession made to the public to sort of let Crimea go, symbolically at least, is potential EU membership. Uh, and I, I think that that is per, perhaps a political trade-off that could be made internally. Again, it's very hypothetical, but I think this will be the, the major issue. And I think it frankly, unfortunately, gives uh, the Kremlin a, a fair degree of leverage over uh, Ukraine's potential future. Because if they decide uh, to just continue to sort of low level violence and, and basically what we've seen since 2014, well, it's gonna be hard for Ukraine to join the EU at, at that state as well. And I guess the last thing I would just say is I think this is the critical problem for Ukraine because we know what a future uh, outside of the EU looks like within Europe. And that's frank, I mean, if we sort of put the UK and Norway to aside, but you know, post-war, uh, is the Balkans, where Ukraine will be sort of stuck between Russia and the EU, will there'll be no momentum for the sorts of EU reforms uh, that are needed to, I think, move Ukraine forward. And frankly, part of the reasons why the Balkans, why that momentum is, was lost, was because the EU didn't want to let them in. And so we had a, this vicious cycle of a lack of impetus for reforms, because even if you did the reforms, you're not going to get in. So I, I think these are the sorts of, that's the, the conundrum that I think Ukraine could be in where it doesn't really deal oligarch its economy. It doesn't really adopt EU standards. It loses momentum. It's sort of stuck between uh, Russia and the EU and in this kind of perpetual, um, uh, in, in a place that just is, is, is not great and, le and prone to instability. So uh, I think resolving the territorial issues is, is I think the big X factor. Yeah, uh, no, those are um, those are eloquent words. I mean, I myself have joined the chorus calling Putin's war a massive strategic blunder for Russia, and I'll stand by that. I think it's going to serve Russia very poorly over uh, over time for many different reasons. But when you lay that out, or when I've been thinking about this question of how Ukraine gets from here to there, from where it is now to EU membership, you start to see the logic of at least some of Russia's military actions that it just makes the path. Uh, more difficult than all of us would um, would like it to be. So it's worth you know thinking creatively. You mentioned treaty reform, uh, Max. I wonder if there aren't other ways in which EU membership could be, perhaps be reconceptualized in in, in in ways that would make it Ukraine uh, would make it easier for Ukraine to enter. Hans, the, did you wanted to jump in with a with the last word on this point? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a whole lot to add. I mean, I agree with what Rachel said about it, it doesn't seem to me that this is an unlimited supply of weapons at all. In fact, there's something really strange about this whole war in Ukraine, it seems to me. I mean, several things. Um, but but one is um, this this way in which, um, you know, I suppose this is this is, you know, fairly typical of a proxy war during the Cold War period. Um, that, you know, um, actually we have, you know, quite, um, quite hard limits in terms of the weapon we, weaponry we're, 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 we're providing, precisely because we don't want this to escalate into a direct conflict between um, NATO uh, and Russia. And so it, it seems to me in that sense, 
um, what Ukraine has is, is very much weaker than what a NATO country could expect in terms of security guarantees. The other puzzling thing, though, about it, and, and this is, I think, less that, like, you know, this wasn't really the case during the Cold War is, you know, we're also, you know, continuing Europeans, uh, I mean, here, continuing to essentially finance um, the, the, the war, or, you know, fi finance Russia's um, war machine. Um, so there is something really strange about about this this war. Um, and, you know, I think related to that, you know, I sort of I've sort of had the feeling in the last three months this is partly what troubles me so much about this um, is that we're acting as if we're at war with Russia, but we're not actually. Um, and in fact, um, you know, seems to me that we're precisely in the moment where we are considering how far we want to go in supporting Ukraine. But because I think, um, you know, the debate in a lot of the media, and I have to say a lot of think tanks, is kind of suggesting that we're already at war. It sort of foreclosed the debate that I think we ought to have in the democracy about who are the Ukrainians, what are they fighting for, um, and how much do we want to support them? You know, rather, we're being told we're already at war. And if you question that, um, that perhaps we might want to think a bit more carefully uh, about what next steps to take. Um, you're told that you're essentially appeasing Putin or playing um, into Putin's hands. So I, you know, as you know, as somebody who's very interested in democracy and works on democracy quite a lot, I'm quite troubled by um, by the debate we've had in the last three months. It feels to me as if we ought to have been asking a lot more difficult questions than we have been. And so, for example, Rachel, when you said, you know, I think you're absolutely right about the political debate in the US. Um, and how, you know, as you put it, the solidarity might begin to fracture. My reaction, I mean, I agree, but my reaction is to put that in a much more positive way, which is to say, you know, we're starting, I think, now to ask the difficult questions that we should have asked three months ago. Um, you know, so when I see pieces, you know, by, you know, Charlie Cupshorn and people like that, you know, dissenting pieces that basically say we don't have a strategy. Um, you know, I, I welcome that. I think that's a good thing. It feels to me that, especially in that first couple of weeks after the war began, we sort of lurched into this and we were doing all kinds of things econ at the economic level, at the military level, at the political level, without thinking through the consequences. I was really, really worried at that time. I'm less worried now about basically escalation to the nuclear level. Um, but I think we're only now beginning to ask the difficult questions that we should have been asking um, from the beginning. Um, I'll stop there for the moment. I'd like to say more about the values question because I think that's really important, but I'll maybe come back to that next. Okay. I, uh, Michael, can I just come back? Because I think Hans has made a really good point there, but I wonder if it's whether or not it's really, we're acting as if it were, or we're talking as if it were. And actually, I mean, just talking about Europe um, and maybe not so much the UK, which obviously isn't quite as dependent, but um, talking as if we're at war, but then actually sort of not really matching that with actions. And I think that's that's what's been happening for so long with Russia. And that's just the worst thing. I think the worst approach, but anyways, sorry. I, just can, I, can I just disagree slightly? Because I do think we are matching with actions. I think that's, exactly what Hans was sort of worried about with the, the economic sanctions, the flurry of economic activity. We're in a queer economic war. And on the military security system side, I have never seen the US basically provide this much military equipment this quickly and set up Berlin style airlift out you know, in Poland on the Ukraine border. Uh, you know, we're allocating $40 billion, 10 billion of which is for security assistance for Ukraine. You know, the State Department's budget is like 50, 50 billion. So the amount of money that I, I, I do think that we have put ourselves, maybe we're, you know, I think Biden did the right thing in putting a limit that the US militarily was not going to intervene. But then other than that, the gloves, you know, have been off uh, in terms of what, what the US at least was willing to do. And that's put pressure on Europeans to do that. So I think we put ourselves on a de facto war footing. I, I think, didn't I think, mean the US, I meant Europe, just to clarify, or the yeah, UK, it's, actually. It's, it's also the point, though, that we, we, we can't, we, precisely because of these hard limits that we set, we can't do enough to actually um, win this war in a decisive way. All we can do is prolong it. So it's that's you know it's the worst of both worlds in a sense. That's what I want. That's what I wanted to say. I mean, I don't really know how to frame this question, but I wonder, like, is unlimited military support the right approach? Because you're right, Hans. We are. I don't know what the end game would look like otherwise. Nor do I know what the end game really looks like on the path that we're on. But 
you're right that we are prolonging this by our continued support with uh, military equipment. And I wonder what that means for, I don't really know the answer to it, but it's a question I've been asking myself. And if we had a shared sense of what the objective was, then you yeah. could sort of calibrate that against that and say, is it going to help us achieve this objective? But my sense is we don't have a shared sense of what the objective is here, what the end game is. Yeah, oh. I think that's the biggest problem is that lack of the shared objective, because if essentially, I mean, I do struggle sometimes with discussions over how we're prolonging the war, because obviously Russia is prolonging the war. It's yeah. Russia that, you know, I know you didn't mean to, to frame it like that, but... Um, but I think part of the reason why we come between these kind of lurch between these two sort of points of discussion is precisely because we don't have this clear idea of actually what we want to achieve, because how can we know how to achieve something if we don't even know what we're trying to achieve? <laughs> it's, it's quite so, difficult. So, uh, Michael, sorry, I, I, I know you want to get back on question, but I, I, I actually think we totally know what our objective is. And our objective is to uh, enable the Ukrainians to defend as much of their territory as possible, to push back the Russians as far as possible. So maybe that is extending the war, but not extending the war means increased military losses for Ukraine. And I think it's, the, I think the clear objective of sanctions, I mean, the, uh, you know, Secretary of Defense was, uh, you know, it was a, a Washington gaffe in, in saying what our uh, strategy was, but it's to degrade Russia's ability to then rebuild its military and to and to be uh, to assert itself on the global stage, so that the economic sanctions, I think, are you know at least from the U.S. perspective, are really trying to just degrade Russia's ability to rebuild its military to be uh, a strong actor in the world. Now, you can question whether that that's the right objective, but I think that's a pretty clearly, I think that objective is pretty clear when you when it's when it when we see everything that's being done. Okay, well, this is a good segue, and I'm delighted to hear the, the vigorous debate. It's exactly what we wanted with this, um, with this conversation, but a segue to a, a question that's a little bit more focused on Russia, and you've sort of gotten there already. I just can't resist noting, the historian of me can't resist noting that you have two very different wars as backgrounds, and we draw analogies sort of chaotically from both of them. In the Second World War, unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan was the objective. Um, and in the Cold War, there never was a real definite stateable strategic objective. And so those are two different kinds of wars. And um, maybe we would clarify our own minds if we could figure out which analogies from which war are most relevant to what's going on. It's also uh, World War I, Michael. Well, that, that too, yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> that's very helpful as well. I've become fascinated recently by the Crimean War, which I think offers its own set of analogies for this conflict, not only geographically, but to some degree um uh ideologically as well but that's a conversation for another um uh for another monterey uh, uh for another monterey chat so asking about russia you know there's been a lot of uh social media a hullabaloo about uh emmanuel macron saying that we should not humiliate russia i don't think it's been a very productive debate uh, i don't think um it's possible to humiliate for for putin to feel humiliated because of what we say or do i don't think that that's just uh that's sort of uh, salient to how he looks uh, at the world. But I think that there is something behind this notion of humiliation that's actually more tangible and more important than just uh, the emotions of that sentiment. I think what Macron is saying is that at a certain point, we're gonna have to deal with Russia and the resolution to this problem in Ukraine. And yes, as Macron has been saying for years, Russia plays a role in the European security architecture. Obviously that's a claim that a lot of people would disagree with, especially now, uh, and, you know, I think implicit to some of your remarks is now it's up to Europe to build a security architecture of its own construction and to make it a, a sort of strong house so that Russia can't interfere too much with it. But obviously that project is Europe's project and whatever Russia is up to is sort of uh, over there. So it's with that in mind that I wanted to ask you just a little bit uh, more directly about the question of, uh, of Russia. I think we could all agree that we're not going to get Russia's unconditional defeat uh, as happened in 1945. Uh, unless it sort of spectacularly uh, implodes, but that can't be a strategic expectation. So we have to presume Russia's continued existence and a foreign policy relatively similar to what it has now and the capacities that it has uh, at the moment, although perhaps degraded as Max was 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 discussing by uh, by sanctions. So if we have that as a kind of constant variable, what should the European security uh, architecture look like? Is it necessary to put up a wall between uh, Europe and Russia to sort of figure out where the border is uh, and defend it? Um, should the arrangements be a little bit more fluid than that? 
um, you know, sort of how can we uh, manage this larger project? I do think that the arguments previously, and I made some of them myself, uh, that we can sort of solve this problem through a strategic or targeted integration of Russia into X, Y, or Z structure. I think that that's over with. I don't think it's a realistic expectation under Putin uh, and may not be in terms of who Putin's successors are, but please challenge that if you wish to, uh, to challenge that. How should we conceptualize Russia's place uh, in European security uh, going forward? Who would like to jump in uh, on the Russia topic first? Just just raise a hand or, 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 or jump in. I'm, I'm happy to jump in, I suppose, as the Russianist on the panel it makes most sense. Um, I, though I actually don't really have much to say because at the moment, I very sadly, I can't visualize a place um, for Russia within a sort of European security architecture. Um, I think that if Putin were to go at any point soon, then he would be not replaced by some sort of young, lovely liberal democratic whippersnapper, but he'd probably be replaced by somebody like Patrushev, who's terrifying and would probably make us all miss Putin. Um, so I, I, right now, um, the, the I suppose the the very sorry state that that we see sort of Russia and Russia in I I don't um, I don't I don't see a place for it but I do think that over the longer term just to come to this point that you made around humiliation I think that's something that does need to be addressed because one of the things that that I think Vladimir Putin has been very adept at doing is merging this sense of national humiliation with a sense of personal humiliation that many people felt during the 1990s and there are actually so you know there are some economic issues there um and perhaps you know if we are ever in a place i know a lot of, is spoken about about the mistakes that were made with with nato and and nato expansion in the 1990s which i agree with i think that nato should have been completely refought with the end of the cold cold war however I think that also more attention needs to be paid to some to economic support and what and what was provide you know what support was provided for for Russians and um, that's not to place all of the blame on the West. Obviously, Yeltsin made decisions, and it's not to really get relitigate too much history to sort of do a Putin. Um, that's something that he himself would do. But I do think that there is some it's, it's a time to sort of look more critically at the 1990s and and the way that the whole issue was approached because you know it could be quite if the sort of Putin regime were to collapse, I think it would happen quite quickly. Um, and it would be nice to think that there was some more considered and reflected um, policy um, in place um, or policy options in place. Who else would like to jump in on the question of where, you know, sort of where, where Russia fits at this point? I can add something. Um, I mean, I, I not going to add a whole lot because I think Jade, Jade is right and I think you're right Michael it's quite difficult to um, to sort of see how you could have a European security architecture that was inclusive of Russia right now but I think I'm probably quite unusual in the sense that you know a lot of people have become much more hawkish since February the 24th and I sort of slightly become gone in the other direction become a bit more dovish actually and and part of the reason for that is that what France and Germany were, were saying all along that you can't have European security against Russia um, I think Russia has actually proven that in the last three months. Um, I think they've proven that actually the French and the Germans were right. At the same time, it's impossible right now for the reasons, Michael, that you and Jade have, have said. So I think we're in this sort of paradoxical situation where, um, you know, actually, actually it turns out we do need a European security architecture that includes Russia even more than we did before, but it's also impossible. And, um, you know, my only, I don't have a solution to this either, except to go back to Ostpolitik, um, which, you know, at the moment, you know, is is considered trash, right? But again, I think this is a real shame because actually the, the problem it seems to me was the way that um, the SPD in Germany in particular kind of distorted Ostpolitik um, and, you know, essentially from Schroeder onwards used the sort of rhetoric of Ostpolitik to pursue a completely different policy, which had nothing to do with Ostpolitik. But if you go back to what Ostpolitik originally was, um, it was a very clever strategic uh, approach whose objective was German reunification. Now, that's not the objective this time, but the clever thing about Ostpolitik, I think, when Egon Barr first conceptualized it was this kind of paradoxical idea that you accept reality in order to overturn it. In this case, as I say, the, the reality was the, was the division of Germany. Um, and his, you know, the breakthrough of Ostpolitik was to say, instead of fighting the division of Germany, let's accept it um, and actually make the GDR more stable, but 
take a series of small steps that in the long term get you to a position of overcoming German, the division of Germany and creating German unity. And that's obviously what happened. So I think we need to sort of keep our eye on that very long term goal, which is a cooperative security arrangement with Russia. But to do some things which might look quite paradoxical right now or, or, or you know, sort of counterintuitive. But I think the real danger is to think that that question now has been resolved the other way. In other words, to say, OK, you know, all we can do now is have massive deterrence against Russia, um, massive military uh, support to Ukraine. And we just hope um, that, you know, Putin falls from power or that Russia is crushed economically um, for all the reasons Jade said. I think that's you know, potentially a really dangerous thing to do. Um, and, and so I just think we have to at least sort of keep our, our eye on this long-term goal, you know, albeit recognizing that in the, at the moment it's impossible to achieve. So with these Cold War analogies in mind, uh, and they are of course very, very helpful, if Ostpolitik is one analogy to, to think of, as you say, Hans, sort of real Ostpolitik uh, of the Egon Bargali Brandt uh, variety, uh, Rachel or Max, would you be interested in exploring containment as a as a possibility? I mean, if Russia can't be integrated, if its intentions are hostile, if its values are are different, uh, and um, uh, and in their extension uh, dangerous uh, to Europe or to the transatlantic relationship, then does it make sense to think of a kind of twenty first century containment? Is that Max what you were sort of indicating yeah. by, by by referencing Secretary Austin? We yeah, I mean, since 2014, by the way, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's sort of de facto where, uh, where we are in some respects. But I, I, you know, I do think that, at least rhetorically, that the Europe and the United States should not sort of close off any future prospects and say Russia could never be part of kind of a broader European security architecture that we could integrate Russia in, into, into Europe. Because, you know, I mean, you would have heard the same things about Germany in 1945, 1946, 1947 and onward. And, and that now, you know, so I, I, I would say that we wanna, we don't wanna sort of foreclose off that option. The other thing I would say is, Michael, you started off, I think the question about uh, Emmanuel Macron's diplomacy and I think on the one hand, while I think some of the rhetoric is a little ham handed, I think also the criticism of him, uh, you know, diplomacy never stops, especially in a war. And it's always important to have those diplomatic channels open. And while sort of the arms control uh, process looks totally dead with the Russians, the fact is, if this war exhausts itself, let's say in a year from now, uh, and we have sort of fixed line, relatively, you know, uh, uh, you know, trench lines and everything set up. Well, what are, what are kind of the, the, the steps? What are the things that the Russians would want? Well, they'd want some guarantees about the weaponry that we're providing Ukraine, that we're not providing sort of advanced cruise missiles. You start getting into very much conventional forces Europe. You start getting into various arms control setup. So I, I think the conclusion of this war, if it doesn't end in total capitulation by one side or the other, uh, it's going to result in the need for kind of Cold War style uh, uh, arms control back and forth over uh, over various limits and, and assurances that then build confidence that there isn't sort of an imminent attack. Um, so I, I think we're very much going to be back into kind of uh, into what looks like kind of Cold War style negotiations, but hopefully then can lead to a bit of stability. The other thing I would just mention quickly is that I think one of the things that I think needs to be created is a real European pillar of NATO. Uh, I think far, partly for the European sake, it's shocking to me how little was done in Europe after Trump was elected and how little uh, uh, concern there was about Europe's inability to actually take care of its own security. And one of my concerns is that we're seeing a lot of increased defense spending, but all the gaps, all the key enabling e equipment is still, Europe will still be very dependent on the United States military to actually do anything even after all this uh, money is spent. And so I think that's one of the things that if I were the United States, I would encourage Europe to look to duplicate some of the assets and capabilities the US has to create a real European pillar of NATO such that they don't just have to, uh, they don't have to be dependent on the United States. Rachel, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I would just add a continuation of, of what Max was saying there. 
I think we're seeing something interesting happen in Washington over the last few months, which is two sort of camps emerging out of this crisis. One is like the reemergence of these traditional transatlanticists who are using this moment to say, we told you so. What we need to do now is recommit to Europe. And what recommit means is send more US troops there, potentially on a permanent basis in Eastern Europe, basically turn Poland and the Baltics into garrison states. And um, this is a good moment to look at what uh, too much of a focus on the Indo-Pacific region does to Europe. I think that's the wrong lesson to learn. And, and I think what will end up happening is the United States is clearly continuing this rebalance to the Indo-Pacific. That is where our strategic focus will be on that region as and, and, and as China as the pacing challenge. So we should use this moment, and Max, I totally agree with you. We should use this moment to support a European pillar of NATO um, from uh, on behalf of the United States. And we sort of saw the Biden administration over the last year or so really start to change its tune on how the United States responds to efforts on behalf of the U European Union to build up its own defense capabilities. I think we've really screwed that up over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And now is the time to sort of reverse course on that and to really support the Europeans in, in I, I don't just mean their like course for strategic autonomy, but building the actual capabilities they need for their own continent and their own neighborhood. Michael, can I, can I add, add something to this? Um, so on two points that slightly kind of fit together. Um, so first of all, on this question of a sort of an alternative European security architecture, I think it's important to make a distinction between two different ways that can work. One is that you integrate Russia into the existing European security architecture, right? You know, so at one point, obviously, there was some discussion about NATO, about Russia joining NATO, right? Um, that's one way to do it. I think that's just, you know, however long term we're talking about, that's not the way to do this. I'm talking about creating new structures, right, that treat Russia in a different way, that don't say, you know, ultimately, we just want to integrate you into our existing structures. Um, and by the way, you know, I think there's an analogy here with Brexit, right, um, which brings me to my second point, because, you know, the only way that uh, a lot of people in the EU can conceive of cooperating with the UK on security um, or on other issues is by partially reintegrating the UK back into EU structures, as opposed to creating new structures that treat the EU and the UK as, as equals, essentially. Um, and that, that brings me, as I say, to, to the, the, the second point here, which is around, you know, European strategic autonomy or European pillar within NATO and so on. You know, the European pillar in NATO discussion has been going on for, you know, decades and decades, right, um, and sort of never really kind of gets, gets anywhere. Um, it's partly because of that, that you've got the European strategic autonomy um, uh, sort of impulse coming from France, but that is ambiguous about the extent to which that is through the EU or not. And again, this is where I think it's a real problem. It can't work. You know, if, if the premise here is that the US, you know, wants to increasingly deploy resources to the Indo-Pacific, which I think is right, and I think we as Europeans should be, you know, a, a empowering the US to do that, then, you know, you, the, the EU can't be the vehicle to do that because it doesn't include the UK. Um, and the UK is such an important uh, uh, provider of security, both in nuclear and conventional terms, um, that, that the, the, you know, the EU as a vehicle for doing that is, is just a kind of a dead end. So, you know, you can go back to, the, to, to, to doing this within NATO, or you can, again, create something different. I'd be kind of inclined um, to, to, to think about creating something different, actually, for this new moment that we're in. Well, those are um, uh, very, very helpful points, Hans, to get us to my third and, and final question before I turn to questions from the audience. And let me just encourage people who have them to use the chat function to send them in. I think we have one so far, but we can also welcome uh, several more. But uh, we'll sort of see what we can do with the uh, with the time constraints. Uh, so Hans, you mentioned Brexit and uh, that brings us in part to, to domestic politics in Europe and um, Jade, you had mentioned Trump and what that might signify for, for NATO and the transatlantic alliance. Um, I wanna make a prediction here. It may you know, go the way of all predictions with, uh, with these kinds of crises, but uh, 
I'm going to predict that military support for Ukraine is going to be pretty ironclad for the foreseeable future. And that, I think, is because people do feel the real sympathy for the people of Ukraine. Uh, and war crimes and atrocities, of course, have, have, have augmented that. And I think in a different sense, there's a, a palpable fear. I mean, I think that um, you know, this is different depending on the geography of, uh, of Europe, but it's, uh, it's real. Uh, maybe a little bit thinner in the US because the US is further away from uh, the crisis zone. But I think that within the US population, there are you know, real questions about uh, instability and danger emanating from this war that will keep US military support uh, on target. And if you look at the Republican Party statements or even the, the Heritage, Heritage Report that came out uh, a couple of days ago about Ukraine sort of dissenting views, it's the economics of it that they seem not to like, but the military component, the military support is pretty, uh, is pretty strong. Uh, be that as it may, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, and, and, and Rachel brought up the point as well, uh, issues of economic stability that are either are genuinely connected to the war or through demagoguery and you know, sort of phony arguments falsely connected to the war, right? Inflation was a problem long before the 24th of February uh, and gas and oil prices are connected to Russia, but not only to that, there's supply chain issues. I mean, there's a lot that makes all of this uh, very, very complicated, but it will be uh, the case that politicians will argue that the war is too costly. Uh, and, you know, there was a long debate about populism before the war, it sort of had one track, uh, you know, people's energy has been focused on the war, so that's not been the number one topic, but we have the midterms coming up, you know, if you look at the French elections, you know, very significant that Macron won as handily as he did, it's also significant that on the left and the right, you had a lot of anti-EU, anti-NATO sentiments that were put forward, so I just want to ask you uh, to reflect for a moment about domestic politics, not necessarily in terms of you know, everything fragmenting or breaking up, that's one uh, possibility, but things also, and I think this was implicit through a lot of your earlier comments, could be unifying uh, and strengthening. So however you see the, uh, the process developing, if you could comment on domestic politics uh, and this war, where do you see the fault lines? Where do you see the significant developments? Where do you see, um, you know, uh, the most important, most important patterns? Who, who would like to jump in there first? And Americans don't have to take America and Europeans don't have to take Europe. It's, 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 you know, it's the transatlantic space. Rachel? I can say something <clears throat> just, just really quickly. I think what's been interesting over the last year and a half, I mean, really since Biden took office, is that the underlying vision or like guiding light of his foreign policy has been this existential struggle between autocracies and democracies. And I think sometimes when you frame things in that way, it does lead to a sort of zero sum outcome where it doesn't leave a lot of room for us to cooperate with certain countries um, on the things that we have to cooperate with them on. Um, and, and, and I think instead what might be a better approach is to sort of reframe that as a revitalization of institutions, Western institutions. And, you know, I think for Biden, this idea that democracies have to like deliver for the people within them is, is one part of that. But it also means that we need to reform Western institutions in a way that makes them a, attractive for countries that might be pulled between what we see as the West and maybe on the other hand, Russia or China. And so I think this could be a really, really interesting moment to sort of reframe that ongoing debate as more of a revitalization of Western institutions. And we've sort of talked about that a little bit, but I think that might be um, that's one short thing I'd just like to add. What do you mean by Western institutions, Rachel? So looking at things like, you know, reforming the Bretton Woods institutions, um, looking at, um, you know, like the, the IMF and, and the World Bank, although that might be, I, I think the mistakes that we've sort of made there is, is that we don't really involve the countries that are direct beneficiaries of those, of those institutions in the debates on how they're, they're created and formed and run. Um, Janet Yellen has talked a lot about that in the past. Um, I, I don't know 
I don't know where I would fall on like the NATO EU side of this, um, or, or, or I think we've debated a lot about what that um, revitalization would look like. Um, I don't have a clear answer to it. You know, that's that's the problem. But that's those are sort of the questions that I'm that I'm running through. Hans, did you want to jump in? Uh, and speak about, uh, you had mentioned Charlie Kapja and, and, and sort of skeptical pieces about, um, you know, sort of, uh, how does one describe the core policies or mainstream policies of the transatlantic world since the 24th of February as a, as a good sign, as a sign of democratic uh, vigor. Is that a point that you'd like to, to, de to, to develop here? That it's not just a battle between yeah. the, sort of the good Atlanticists and the bad populists, but it's, 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 it's more variegated and complicated than that. Yeah, ex exactly. You know, so I, I feel as if in the last six years since 2016, um, and, you know, I was in London for Brexit, I was, you know, in DC when Trump got elected. Um, since then, I think we've had this tendency to think in terms of these really simplistic binary oppositions, you know, in terms of our domestic politics, in terms of our international politics. Um, and, you know, and, and I think it's really sort of, it, it's, it's really been unhelpful. So, you know, one version of that is this kind of, you know, very binary, simplistic opposition between, um, you know, centrists and populists, centrists are the good guys, populists are the bad guys, by the way, all the populists are the same, you know, there's the populist playbook, and, and you know, Brexit equals Trump, and so on. Um, this, I think, has been super unhelpful in terms of understanding what's been going on domestically in our societies. Um, but then on top of that, you now have the war in Ukraine, which I think we're also looking in, in a very black and white way, in a way that slightly puzzles me and troubles me, because I think when you've had other conflicts like Syria, we've looked at them in a very kind of, you know, we see that the complexity, right? And we don't identify very, very simplistically with one side or the other. And we often accept the limitations of what we can and can't do. We've looked at this, com this conflict in a completely different way for reasons that I can only explain in sort of civilizational terms, right? You know, we've, we've been told many times, you know, that these are people who look like us, whoever the us is there. It's itself a kind of exclus exclusionary kind of way of, of framing who we are. Um, so the two things have come together. And, and so I think there's this tendency in a lot of discussions that I've been in about Ukraine in the last three months to think that, you know, centrists are all pro-Ukrainian and populists are all pro-Russian, right? And, you know, so you put those two kind of good evil kind of conflicts together and you get a very simplistic narrative of, of this conflict. Now, to me, you know, you've only got to look at the country in Europe that is probably leading uh, in, in, in the war in Ukraine, which is Poland, to see that this is not quite that simple, right? That you have a government here, a far right government, um, that uh, we were told until three months ago did not share European values. In fact, that's why the EU was having a massive battle with it over the rule of law. And now apparently they do stand for European values, which I think illustrates this kind of confusion about what it is that we're fighting for, what it is, what, what is this Europe that we think we're fighting for here? What is this West that we think we're fighting for here? I think it's utterly kind of confused. Um, and so, you know, I find that quite troubling that, that one of our allies um, in, the, you know, the, one of our leading allies um, in, this, um, in this war in Ukraine is, is, a, is a far right government. Um, that has, I think, a very civilizational view of what the West is. Think back to the Trump speech that he gave in Warsaw in 2017, which was about this kind of alternative kind of civilizational kind of idea of the West. Um, and, you know, to, I worry a bit that what's happened, you know, since the war started is that a lot of mainstream figures have essentially embraced that kind of civilizational idea of the West or Europe for, for, for that matter. Um, so I find this all kind of um, rather uh, troubling. Max, if I could just turn to you for a second, since I think that uh, you know more than many foreign policy types, you have a lot of experience with domestic politics and think a lot about the uh, the interconnections. Of course, any point that you wish to make is 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 more than welcome. But if you could just speculate for a moment about both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, I mean, it seems like Biden hasn't gotten too much of a bounce uh, from the war, but um, you know, uh, I think over the long term, this could be. Uh, an asset of the of the Biden administration. I don't think it's going to be quite the same Republican Party after the war as you had before the war. I think that there are certain constraints that the war is imposing on the Republican Party, but those are just my uh, speculative thoughts. I'm very curious to get your thinking about this question. Yeah, I I, I think I think you're. I think us foreign policy hands tend to overestimate the impact that foreign policy has on, on especially U.S. 
uh, domestic politics. I think this is one where the Republic <coughs> Republicans generally had a choice whether to oppose, you know, supporting Ukraine or be in favor. And whilst Rachel was right pointing out earlier that probably a higher number than, than one would expect of Republicans dissenting. Uh, in general, if you look at the critique, you know, 80%, I think of Republicans disapprove of where Biden is, uh, how he's handled Ukraine, but the overwhelming amount of uh, number of that says that it's because he's been too weak <clears throat> and hasn't been strong enough uh, uh, in, in supporting Ukraine. So I, I actually think going forward, our security assistance that we're providing to Ukraine is gonna be a bit like the security assistance to Israel. It is strong bipartisan support. It's going to move move forward. Anytime Ukraine needs anything, why have a political fight over that? So, uh, and then I think going forward, if you sort of fast forward this into the Republican primaries, I do think this creates a bit more of an issue for Trump um, in his potential bid to uh, become president again, should he decide to run, where you know Trump's Russia connections uh, are very real. The Senate Intelligence Committee report that came out that was chaired by the Republican Senate, uh, Richard Burr, who is the ranking or the chairman, um, you know, it's a quite a damning report. There's a lot in there for Trump's political opponents to mine. Uh, and so I, I do think that Trump's uh, fealty or closeness with Putin could be a real issue for him in, in a Republican primary. It, it may not be. I think it's, it's sort of hard to tell. But and I think we're seeing that with some far right candidates uh, in Europe as well. The one thing I would I'll mention just quickly on the, the, the domestic politics is to look at the vote that happened in Denmark that everyone has sort of ignored. I think it's quite astonishing. You know, Denmark had a referendum about whether to join the EU's military instruments and decided 67 to 33 uh, to join. And a lot of people were expecting this is going to be quite close, we'll probably pass, it's going to be you know, 52 48. No, it was quite overwhelming, which I think demonstrates the broader support for the EU to become somewhat of a stronger military actor. And just to respond quickly to a point Hans made, I think just because the UK decided to leave the EU doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense for the EU to move forward on a number of uh, defense areas. And in fact, I would say the major problem with European defense is that right now European defense is about defending various European countries. It's national, not European, and that you have huge gaps in capabilities because European states individually don't have the assets uh, and no one can afford to do it individually that are needed to actually fight as Europeans. And so someone needs to be the bill pair there. It's not going to be any individual European states. It's not going to be the UK and it's not going to be NATO, which doesn't have revenue. So I think that's where the EU can play this critical role as, 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 a, as a real, uh, as an ability to kind of link European forces together uh, or at least providing the, the money so that you can buy the assets, the airlift and air tankers and other things like that. Jade, would you like to jump in? I know this may not be in, in your eyes, your, your exact area of, of, of research focus, but would you like to jump in on questions of domestic politics in, in Europe um, or the US? Yeah, and to pick up on a couple of points, just I really liked um, Rachel's point around the idea. It seems to me what you've described, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a sort of simultaneous democratization and almost partial de-Westernization of institutions that were originally set up by the West, but, but quite clearly just are not um, performing ably or, or certainly as well as, as they might right now. Um, and then also Hans's point around um, rhetoric. I mean, in terms of domestic politics, obviously, well, not necessarily obvious actually to people, um, it'll be obvious to Hans um, and probably to everybody on the panel, but um, we're waiting for a vote of no confidence um, this evening. Um, so we'll see how that happens. Pro probably he'll win, but um, in any case, um, that things are shifting a little bit here. However, I think that any shift, I don't know how momentous a political shift would have to happen for UK, um, sort of both political and maybe even public, and I think also public opinion to shift on Ukraine. Part of that is because the way that the war has been framed is not only just in that civilizational sense, but also very much, you know, there's been a lot of um, appeals, you know, some really beautiful speeches that really by Zelensky and very clever, very carefully curated, um, and not just to UK audiences, but in particular, you know, sort of pictures, memes with pictures of the Blitz, uh, lots of references to 1940, the sort of thing that normally goes down quite well with a large segment of, of the British population. Um, of course, that's not the only reason why. There's also the way that, of, the main reason is the way that Russia is prosecuting this war, but it's just the way that it's been framed, um, I think uh, it, it 
ensures that there will consistently be quite a lot of support where I do agree with where I agree with hands though and this sort of relates um hopefully I've not gone off too much of it on a tangent is it's very problematic if we try to make a purely civilizational or even just a good versus evil argument for support for the war and I think that in the long term that will undermine public support for the war because eventually people will already you see it there are going to be discussions about the Azov battalion there are going to be discussions about Bender the longer this goes on and I think it's just completely insane to expect that every single Ukrainian fighting the Russian is doing it out of a commitment to um, democracy. Some of them are doing it just for pure nationalism. Some of them are doing it because they hate Russians. You know, some of them will be bad. And it just so happens that they're fighting for a cause that we also find to be a good cause. Um, and there needs to just be much more nuance about this because in the long run, it will just completely undermine in it, perhaps in a similar way to what was seen in Syria, where at first the discourse was quite, I'm talking sort of 2011, 2012, 2013, first the discourse could be quite simplistic. And then all of a sudden it was it became clear that that some of the Syrian rebels might not be people that you would have around for your dinner party for example um, and that then started to undermine um, and, and to complicate so I think it's important that the conflict is complicated um, and that of course we've already discussed the need to set a clear and a clear objective in order that we know how to get there and I know Max has disagreed and said that he feels the objective is quite clear I personally think it could be clearer but once we have that objective I think then that would become a time where there might be some more complexity might be added and we should certainly encourage a, always encourage the democratization of the debate provided that it's being had in good faith um because Otherwise, um, I think in the long term, it, it will undermine support for Ukraine. So even if you come at this from a ridiculously pro-Ukrainian position, as I would say that I probably do, um, there needs to be this honesty in this debate. Well, um, with references to, to nuance, uh, to democratization of debate, um, uh, to complexity, and uh, also to principle and to values, um, I think uh, I'll start to just draw things to a close. But let me first thank our four wonderful speakers, Max Berkman, Jade McGlynn, Rachel Rizzo, Hans Kudnani, for a very you know, vigorous uh, and I think illuminating debate about the big questions uh, Europe faces uh, in the shadow of this terrible war. Let me just emphasize that the Monterey Conversations are an ongoing series. So anybody in our audience should, should keep an eye out for future such conversations. For example, one that's gonna take place tomorrow uh, with Jade, myself and some other participants, but um, we're just delighted that you could join, and uh, in the in the spirit of uh, of uh, of the Monterey conversations, have this uh, you know very very um, interesting debate. As Hans points out, we didn't take the question from uh, the audience member. Um, the conversation was whole and complete uh, in and of itself, but hopefully we'll have another chance to gather this this group together, and then we can. Uh, either pick up with that question or take other audience questions. But thanks again. Thanks, uh, Jarlath McGuckin, for, uh, you know, every kind of support with this and, you know, to Anna Vasilyeva uh, in, in Monterey. And thanks once again to our participants. See all of you live soon, I hope. <laughs>